All right, everybody. Um, this is the Cumberland River Compact's uh, first video education program. So we're excited to bring you this opportunity today to learn with us. I'm Catherine Price, the Education Program Manager for the Cumberland River Compact. And then we've also got Alex Stark on the line, and she is our Environmental Education Coordinator through the AmeriCorps program. So we're excited to be with you guys today. This is kind of a modified version of our Creek Critters program that we bring to a lot of elementary schools. But if you're in middle school, if you're in high school, if you're in college, if you're an adult, this is for you. This is an opportunity for you to learn about creek critters and how we use aquatic biodiversity for stream health. So first we'll start with what is the Cumberland River and where is it? So the Cumberland River is part of this um, watershed you see right here. So the Cumberland River starts up near Harlan, Kentucky and it flows for about 687 miles through Kentucky, Tennessee, back into Kentucky. And through that whole area, it's about 18,000 square miles of land that eventually drains to the river. So if you look at all those different colored areas on the map, that shows all of that land. When the rain falls on those areas, that water is going to eventually end up in the Cumberland River. So this is a really big area. And it means that there's a lot of different types of pollution that we might see in our water. So again, pollution is just kind of the yucky stuff we don't want to see in the water. So in rural areas and agricultural areas, we end up with things like excess pesticides or fertilizer ending up into the water. Um, and this can come when there's too much added. And then when that rain comes, all of that comes off into the stream. And so, um, so you can see that um, in our waterways. And then we also have the same thing in urban areas. And so in our urban areas, we have pollution from um, industry, we have pollution from changes in, the, um, in our land. So when we have um, more areas like parking lots and, gr and grocery stores and schools being added because we need all those things to live, of course, um, that takes away a lot of the spongy area and replaces that with hard area that's impermeable to water. So instead of having grassy area where that water can soak in, now that water's hitting a area like a parking lot and carrying different types of pollution with it. And so, <laughs> In urban areas, we have a lot of water pollution as well. But the big question, question that we want to dive into today is how do we determine stream health? And how do we look at that as scientists? And so Alex is going to talk with you about how we use our creek critters to do that. All right. So in order to determine whether or not a stream is healthy or if it's really polluted, what we mainly use is our benthic macroinvertebrates. And so you can see in this image that our macroinvertebrates or aquatic macroinvertebrates that we have, it's widely diverse. Like we have a lot of different types of invertebrates and they have a lot of different roles and a lot of different capabilities. And so being able to study them helps us to be able to study our streams as well based on where these organisms live. And so I use the term benthic macroinvertebrate and it's kind of a mouthful. So we're gonna kind of walk through that term um, step by step. So benthic uh, just means bottom. It means the bottom of the stream, bottom of a river. Um, benthic starts with B, bottom starts with B. That's how I remember it. Um, and then macro, um, when typically that can mean something that's really big, but here it means something that's big enough that I can see it in the palm of my hand. And then invertebrate just means that these organisms don't have a backbone. So a benthic macroinvertebrate is something that lives on the bottom, it is big enough to see in the palm of your hand, and it uh, doesn't have a backbone. Benthic macroinvertebrate. And so here's a, an example of one of our benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, and so if you guys want to just take a second to kind of see if you think you may have seen this somewhere else before or if you've ever seen something similar to this. Um, when I first saw it, I had no idea what it was. Um, this is actually a dragonfly larva. So to me, it doesn't really look anything like a dragonfly yet. Um, it's going to take it a little bit before it looks like the dragonflies that we probably are all familiar with. But Dragonflies can actually live in the water for up to five years. And so their larva, that's when they, they spend five years in the water looking like this before they come out and grow into the organisms that we recognize. 
And so a few of the um, like traits that we want to talk about with this benthic macroinvertebrates, the first is the wing pads, or are the wing pads. And so here you can see these kind of small growths on the back of the dragonfly, and they're not used for flying, and they're really not used for swimming either. They're just there for when the dragonfly grows out, it's going to grow into those big wings that we would all recognize if we saw them. And then the next trait that we want to talk about are the gills. So if we zoom in on this image right here, um, you can see these kind of brown tufts. They look kind of poofy that are in between some of the crevices on the um, back of the dragonfly. And those are the gills, that little poofy material is how this um, organism is able to breathe underwater. Because we said that all of our benthic macroinvertebrates live in the water, so they have to have the capability to breathe while they're in there. And I always thought this is kind of a weird place, but apparently it works for the dragonfly. So that's pretty interesting. And um, so you may be wondering how um, we're able to actually have access to these organisms or how we're able to catch them and study them and use them to assess our streams. So I'm going to show you a quick video of how we um, catch them or how we go out and do this type of sampling. So here we go. So to take a sample, what we do is place the, the kick net down on the substrate, make sure it's firmly down on the substrate, and then kick vigorously upstream of the net. So what we're doing here is we're disturbing the bed of the stream. We can uh, have a bit of a, a rub over of cobbles and boulders, so we can get small insects and vertebrates to wash and go there. The more vigorously you kick, the more insects and more invertebrates become enclosed in the net. So now I've got a net here with um, a sample of animals, it's got silk and other stuff in it. So I'm just going to give it a little wash here to get my sample down to the bottom. <coughs> then what I'm going to do is transfer it over into a bottle, which we're going to keep in sample. Great. And so that's how we go out into our streams here in Tennessee as well. Um, to collect these benthic macroinvertebrates to assess our stream. And so he was using a net like this one um, on the left side of the screen, and that's called a D-net or a kick net. And so you just hold it flat on the ground just like he did, and then your critters kind of wash down and you get a bunch of stuff in it like leaves and sticks and rocks and also your organisms and dirt. And so after you have a full net, he was going ahead and he put his in like a closed container, and then he was taking it back to the lab to assess it. But the way that we are able to do it here, or the way that the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation does their um, assessments of the streams, they will just do it right there on the side of the stream and take a list of everything that they found. So you take your net and you empty it into this littoral wash bucket. And this bucket looks a little bit different than a regular bucket because it has these big holes on the bottom. And we said that our benthic macroinvertebrates need water to breathe and to survive. And so once you have emptied everything into your bucket, you go ahead and set the bucket in the water and those big holes lets water come in through the bottom so that our organisms stay alive. And then we have kind of a screen door material that's kind of hard to see in the picture, but on top of those big holes, there's a like screen that keeps the invertebrates inside of the bucket so that we're able to kind of take um, account of everything that's in there. And then, so we sit down, we're sitting next to our stream, we have a full bucket sitting in the water, and then we take this tray, this white tray, so that we can see everything that's on it, and we kind of start taking everything out of the bucket one by one. So we grab a rock, put it in the tray with a little bit of water, and then all of the organisms are going to start to move around in the tray so that we can see them, and then identify them and write down a list of everything that we found. And this list is important because each of these different invertebrates has a different um, has different capabilities, and they're able to live in different um, types of water and different types of pollution. So on the left side of our screen, you can see that um, these organisms, like the mayfly, the caddis fly, the water penny, the river mussel, these are really, really pollution sensitive organisms. So if you get a little bit of pollution in the water, these are going to be the first organisms to die off. They're not going to be able to survive in really polluted water. And then in the middle, we have our somewhat pollution tolerant, uh, like our helgramite, our dragonfly, our crayfish. Um, and these, if you get a little bit more pollution, those are going to die off next. These are going to be the ones that can handle a little bit of pollution, but really not a, not a whole lot. And then 
on the far right side of our screen, we have our pollution tolerant organisms. So like our leeches, our scuds, our water boatmen, our aquatic worms, these are going to be able to survive in any type of pollution. So if there's a lot of pollution, these are going to be the organisms that thrive and you find a lot of those. Um, you'll, they'll do really well when we have kind of dirty water. But there's a few things to note when we're looking at this um, graphic. So a lot of people will say, well, what about the bad bugs? I don't like those bugs like our leeches and our scuds and our water boatmen. And it's important to know that there really are no bad bugs. These bugs just have the capability of living in different, in different types of water. So they're able to live in pollution or polluted water. And that's not their fault. They, they just are, and they do what they're meant to do. They would just survive. And the next thing that's important to know is that we want to have somebody from each of these groups. So having organisms from each group means that our ecosystem or our stream community is strong. And it's just like in our human communities and our everyday communities, we wanna have um, different types of people and people with different abilities and different capabilities. And that makes us a strong community. So our streams are no different than that. So keep that in mind as we go through this. <laughs> and so what we're gonna do now is kind of an activity where we assess whether or not a stream is healthy, somewhat healthy, or if it's uh, really polluted. So everybody to imagine that we're sitting beside a stream and we have that bucket full of organisms next to us, and we're gonna go ahead and start taking stuff out and making a list of everything that we found. And we're gonna use that data to assess what our stream looks like. So first, the first things we find, we find a water boatman, we find a leech, and we find an aquatic sow bug. So do you think that this water is going to be polluted, somewhat polluted, or is it really healthy? So this stream is going to be very polluted so far because we've only found organisms that do well in polluted water. So it looks like right now that nothing else was able to survive. But we still have a whole bucket full of organisms, so let's keep looking and see what else we find. So we kept going and we found a helgramite, a dragonfly, and a crayfish. So now what does our water look like? Is it polluted, somewhat polluted, or is it clean? So this water is only somewhat polluted. We started to find um, these organisms that are able to live in a little bit cleaner, a little bit cleaner water. So we know that it must not be so bad that these things can't live. But we still have some stuff left in our in our bucket. So we can keep going. Let's keep counting and see what we find. So we went and we found a mayfly, a water penny, which is the cutest animal in the world, in case anybody cares, um, and a stonefly larva. So we know that now, is it healthy, somewhat, somewhat polluted, or really polluted? So we, this is a really healthy stream system. We found an organism from each of the different groups. And like we said before, having biodiversity like this is really important for having a strong creek community. So this is a good looking stream. Having streams like this is what we really want to see in our local streams and waterways. But so now I also want to talk about um, where our benthic macroinvertebrates fit in while we look at this energy pyramid. So the bottom of the energy pyramid, we have our photosynthetic organisms, our algae and our grass that grows in the water. And those are all, um, they grow because the sun gives them their energy. And so they have lots of energy here at the bottom. They have the biggest section. And then as we go up, at each layer of the pyramid as they go, they lose 10% of the energy that they get from their um, sustenance. And so the primary consumers, those are some of our benthic macroinvertebrates. That's the first place that we see them. And these are our herbivores, the organisms that are eating our algae and our plants. And then the next group that we see our benthic macroinvertebrates is our secondary consumers. And these are our carnivores, which are eating our herbivores. And they, so our dragonflies and our helgramites are going to be eating other benthic macroinvertebrates, which is kind of cool. Um, and, but as they go, they're losing some energy. So it's less efficient the higher up you go. So that's where our benthic macroinvertebrates fit in in this chart. But as we keep going, we're going to talk about the aquatic web of life. So in this diagram, we have our entire creek community, which includes our benthic macroinvertebrates. It also includes our amphibians and reptiles, our birds, and some of our mammals. So these 
everybody in our stream community is connected in lots of different ways. And we can see that through these green lines. And as we go through this, um, this uh, kind of activity, um, when the lines become dotted, that means that they're kind of falling apart or our bonds are breaking. And then if they just turn black, that means that that bond has kind of fallen apart. So in our community, we have a lot of different, uh, the first starting at the top, the photo you've seen before, that is our uh, dragonfly larva that we saw in the beginning. And then to the right of him, we have our fly. They're really cool. They build little like houses around themselves out of rocks and strings. They're neat. Um, and then underneath him, we have the great blue heron, which is a big bird that y'all have probably seen. And then next is the stonefly, and then a cute little beaver, and then a frog, and a mayfly, and then a bass, and that's a beetle, which is another one of our benthic macroinvertebrates, and a kingfisher, and that is a really cool bird. If you ever see one, you should take a picture and send it to me. And then there is the uh, Tennessee water snake. So as we go through this, this is their stream habitat. They all live in the water right in the middle or right around it. And the most important part of this is on the right side of the stream, stream we see our riparian zone. And the riparian zone is made up of trees, bushes, and grass. And this area is important in keeping our water healthy because as we have runoff, which Catherine told us about earlier, um, coming in from the thousands of square miles that we have in the Cumberland River Basin, these riparian zones are what helps us filter out all of this runoff. So if we don't have this riparian zone, like on the left side of the screen, when we have apartment buildings and we have schools and grocery stores and a lot of pavement, that runoff gets a lot more aggressive and it gets a lot faster. And it brings a lot of pollution into our streams and that's really not what we want. So it's really important to keep our riparian zone. But, so I'm gonna tell a story, it's a sad story, about one day when we lost our riparian zone. So one day somebody decided that they wanted to build an apartment complex right next to our stream so that we would be able to see the stream from our apartment windows. And they decided that to do that, they were gonna cut down the riparian zone and start digging up all the dirt so that their apartment would have a basement or do whatever and look really nice. And then after they started digging everything up, it started raining. And all of the rain washed a bunch of sediment into our stream ecosystem. And so when we look at how that is gonna be affecting our um, aquatic web of life, we see that our benthic macroinvertebrates, if we remember back to before, they breathe with their gills, they live in the water. And so they're gonna need to have really either clean water or, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little sick. <laughs> and then um, they need water that they're able to breathe in. And so if you dump a bunch of sediment, their gills are gonna get all clogged up and they're not gonna be able to breathe anymore. So sadly, all of our benthic macroinvertebrates died and they weren't able to survive in our stream ecosystem. And so let's see what effect that had on our web of life. So we have a few of our still good to go green, um, green connections, but we also have a lot of green that's kind of iffy, it's falling apart. And then we have a few that are even like our black connections that are just, they're gone. We no longer have that connection. So, and unfortunately the story gets even worse because after there's no benthic macroinvertebrates, there's also no um, fish or frogs because they weren't able to have anything left to eat and we also lose our snakes because they weren't able to eat the frogs or the fish anymore so let's see what happens when we lose those guys so we have a lot more of our broken bonds still some that are falling apart we still have one one good connection but really we can see that it's kind of our web is a little sad now but we keep going and we also lose our birds because our birds don't have anything to eat. They're, we're gonna eat the fish and the frogs and the snakes, but they're gone and they can't now. And they also don't have anything to build their nests out of. So we lost them. And now the only thing that we have less, left in our web of life is our beaver. And our beaver is a mammal just like we are, but he relied on the fish in order to uh, have something to eat. And he also was using the trees and the sticks from the riparian zone to build his home and he doesn't have that anymore. So he died too, which is sad. 
And so now we have a completely fallen web of life. And this all started with the loss of our benthic macroinvertebrates. And all of that happened because we got rid of our riparian zone. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we have those things to be able to protect our ecosystems. And then to take it a step further, we want to say, are humans going to be affected by the fall of this web? Is this something that's going to affect us as well? And truly it is, because if we don't have these organisms to support our, first of all, our diets, that we don't have, we wouldn't have fish anymore, that would be sad. But also, we rely heavily on clean water. And if we don't have clean water to keep us alive, then that would not bode well for human beings in general. So making sure that we're taking care of the water that we have and the stream ecosystems that we have is really important. And the ways that we're able to do that, and some of the ways that you all would be able to help us do that, is making sure that when we're mowing our grass, we're not, med or not mowing all the way up to the edge of the water, because that's just like a small riparian zone. We want to make sure we have enough um, spongy material there to soak in the water and stop our pollution. And then we want to keep land as permeable as we can, whether that's if we're building something close to the water, we want to have permeable pavement, or we want to keep grass as close to the water as we can. And then if you have the opportunity, go ahead and plant some trees somewhere. That's either going to help our air quality or it's going to help our water quality. Either way, planting trees is always really good. And then if you see any litter, whether that's if it's nowhere near the water, remember what we said, every, that whole 18,000 square miles is going to wash into the Cumberland River anyway. So anytime that you see litter, it's important to pick it up. And then the final and most important thing that you can do to help us protect our water is making sure that everybody that you know knows that it's important to keep our water clean, whether that's your schoolmates, your family, or just some random people that you met one time. It's important that everybody knows. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Catherine, and she's going to tell you guys a little bit about our Creek Critters program and how we talk about um, this with our elementary schools. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. So I hope you guys enjoyed kind of diving into um, what we use our creek critters for, some different types of critters, and really seeing how important those teeny tiny benthic macroinvertebrates are for our entire aquatic ecosystem. So today's um, video program was kind of a modified version of what we bring to classrooms. Obviously, we can do a lot more interactive activities when we have our classes together. So we work with Annie Goodhue, who you see in the picture here. She's got some of those tools that Alex was talking about earlier. And um, she's a retired aquatic biologist from TDEX. So she's a scientist that used to do this all the time for her job. So if this stuff is cool for you, um, whether you're in high school or looking for a career change, there are really cool opportunities to do this for a job as an aquatic biologist. So through our Creek Critters program, we go to mostly third and fourth grade classrooms across Middle Tennessee, uh, bringing this program in so kids get to learn about these crazy benthic macroinvertebrates and see how important that they are. So we wanted to give a few shout outs as a thank you for today. First, um, a lot of the awesome pictures that Alex had are from macroinvertebrates.org. It's a whole website devoted to benthic macroinvertebrates. So if you wanna learn more about the different types, practice identification. There's even a quiz that you can take to help you uh, learn to identify them. We really recommend checking that out. Um, and as we said, this is kind of our first of our video programs that we're exploring for education during this time when a lot of us are at home. So we'd love to know if there are other topics you think would be really interesting, if there's other formats that work for you. Today we did kind of a recorded version um, and then you know posting it, but we could do something more interactive or live as well. Uh, my email is right there, so feel free to send me an email or leave a comment below with some of your thoughts and maybe your favorite benthic macroinvertebrate that you've ever heard about. And final thank you to the Ryman Hospitality Properties Foundation and the Henry Laird Smith Family Foundation that both support our work bringing creek critters to classrooms across Middle Tennessee. So thank you all, um, have a great day, and we hope you enjoyed learning along with us. Thanks so much.